So I'm here with Rick Braun and his, uh, is it correct, Braun? That's Rick correct. Braun, uh, in his beautiful Northwest home, uh, pretty much most of his life, I did his windows for how many years now? Oh, well over 20 years. Over 20 years. So I never saw Rick. I just saw the home and the fruit that he bears, and it's beautiful, beautiful fruit that he bears. His home has always been very tight, and everything's in perfect shape. And so even though I never knew the man, I saw the fruit of the man, and I was always very impressed with you, very impressed. So how in the world... Did you become, you've been a pilot most of your life. Right. Okay. How did you end up becoming a pilot? Did you know someone? Did you, I mean, how, what's your story? I did. And uh, I was uh, a United pilot back in Southern California. It was was based, he a neighbor? Uh, yep. Yeah, okay. And uh, basically uh, a coach in the YMCA. Ah. And uh, his son and I, uh, we announced uh, that we thought we'd go out and become ski bums, and of course that didn't go for very well. It didn't go with my dad, sounds or great with, though. With uh, Steve Jofion's dad, who was the one that flew for United, yeah. So he took us out to LAX, and in those days, the biggest airplane that they had flying was a DC-8 at mm -hmm. United, and gave us a tour through the you know, operations and on the airplane and everything else. And I said, "Hey, this is really neat. So it's sexy, uh, yeah." And they had these advertisements in the paper to go flying for 40 bucks and, you know, went out to the Van Nuys Airport and went up for a half hour and I got uh, got turned on. That's exciting. Yeah. That's exciting. So, um, so did you, a lot of people follow going into the military, getting trained in the military. Right. Did you follow that path? No, I didn't. Uh, I was trying to. Um, I ended up... Uh, getting my private license and stuff before I was of age to go in the military. And I was targeting on a NAVCAD program, which was where you had to have two years of college. And then, of course, pass the physical and the exams to go to uh, Naval Flight School. But they canceled that program. So I kind of lost my motivation on that. So uh, I um, ended up just uh, building time and going to college and stuff, and uh, then the draft lottery came along, and I uh, drew a very high number to where my probability of being drafted was very low. Mm. And I used that when I got my flight time to sell that to Aloha Airlines, that I probably wasn't going to be a candidate to be drafted. And so you say sell that. What does that mean? I'm sorry? You said sell that. I got a chance to sell that. Oh, I know it was by selling it. It was to uh, basically to convince the airline oh, okay. that I would not be drafted One after they invested their time in, in flight training. So I went to, uh, well, it was kind of a buildup, of course. I ended up uh, flying between the islands uh, doing what we called uh, basically sightseeing on twin-engine and four-engine airplanes. You say islands. Which islands? Uh, Hawaiian islands. Hawaiian. Sorry to be so... Uh, no problem. Yeah. So uh, how old were you at that time? I was uh, 18 and 19 when I started that. Oh, I feel so bad for you. 18, 19, pilot in Hawaii. I bet you well, had I difficult... Well, I was a co-pilot then. Co-pilot. Well, I still think you had a difficult time getting a date. <laughs> It was we had uh, we had some toys there. We had some sailboats and uh, other things that were attractions. So uh, that's exciting. So, so you're so basically you're the they call that the puddle or hopper or something like that from island. Uh, it was island? island hopper, yeah. Island hopper. But uh, the originally before we got to Aloha Airlines, we were just basically we picked them up early in the morning. They'd be uh, or bus to the airport, and then we'd take them out. We'd uh, serve them a kind of a uh, uh, continental breakfast on the airplane. We'd fly down to the big island, then they'd get on a bus, go around to the volcano, then we'd take, go from the volcano on the big island, we'd fly to Maui, Kanapali, mm -hmm. and they'd have uh, lunch there, and and would sightsee as well. And then we'd uh, take off from Maui, overfly Oahu, and go to Kauai, wow. and uh, they Beautiful. went on the Fern Grotto tour. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but it's kind of famous on Kauai. Mm -hmm. And then they go to dinner, and then at about eight o'clock, they load up in the airplane, and we take them back to Oahu. So it was a full day. And what it was a, a wonderful yeah, tour. Was, that I think it was 
it was well under a hundred bucks per person. Really? In those days. So that's uh, wow. That's about 1967 through 68. Wow. So I I don't know what the inflationary uh, push would be on on the dollar then, but it was in those days it was still a very good deal. That's and, a very good deal. Yeah. And then uh, from there I moved on to a more of a commuter type operation, just flying passengers, not really sightseeing, with uh, De Havilland Twin Otters. And the reason why that was attractive in building my time was it was turbine engine time, which the airlines look at uh, favorably. So the previous flying was all done in reciprocating engines. Then I moved up to the turbine engines, built some time there. And so I probably had about, uh, oh, I don't know, 12, 1,300 hours when I was hired by Aloha. That's good hours. And it was all multi-engine time. And if I'm right, to be entry level is about 1,000 hours. Well, the rules have changed now. Uh, they went up to uh, 1,500 hours now as a minimum due to accidents and other uh, influences. If you come out of the military, they uh, allow that uh, reduction in time. And I think if you come out of some of the academies, uh, like uh, University of North Dakota, um, I think uh, Purdue has one as well, is that they'll give you an hourly reduction because they believe that the quality of your instruction is, is so high. So that, uh, but uh, for general purposes, it's 1,500 hours now to get to the airlines, which is, uh, takes some time to build that up. It does take some time. Yeah. Yeah, it does take some time. So I'm sitting here... Um, Looking at the uh, some of the questions you suggested, and I think they're fantastic. Uh, you went from flying in Africa. Yes, uh, I'll kind of paint the picture here with the yes, Adelaide Airlines. So uh, I got hired from the Twin Otter, the turbine engine mm -hmm. operation, to Aloha Airlines in 1969. Okay, and so I was um, a co-pilot for a long time because uh, the airline did not. Exp expand. There was a lot of reasons for that. Competition, price of fuel, all of this. Mm -hmm. So uh, in 1982, 81 to 82, they were looking for volunteers to go fly in Africa that an outside group wanted to lease two of Aloha airplanes. Mm. Yes, yes. Take them to Lagos, Nigeria, do some of the flying for Nigeria Airways. The airplanes were painted in Nigeria Airways colors. They were still U.S. airplanes, so they had to be flown by U.S. pilots. Mm, okay. So uh, I volunteered for that because that would give me an opportunity to fly as captain. So immediately I took that. I was single, Smart. so uh, you know I had uh, the ability to kind of make choices that other people couldn't make. Yes, yes. So uh, then uh, when I got down there, the... Uh, uh, person that they had picked for being a chief pilot didn't work out so well so the they approached me and asked me because I was kind of the longest guy down there. I went down there with the delivery of the first airplanes and uh, asked me if I was going to if I'd be willing to be the chief pilot and I said oh man I don't want to do that I want to be one of the guys so I put up uh, all these requirements and they said yes oh. to the point where I couldn't say no oh so, wonderful so it uh, worked out very well so That's it was a exciting. Good year. We made a lot of money for uh, all the investors on that. Uh, everybody came home with uh, relative good health. Uh, right. Airplanes were not uh, damaged at all. Uh, they were worked hard, but not damaged. And so it was uh, a good uh, kickoff to uh, future endeavors. Wonderful. How exciting. So you actually kind of saw from the outside in where investors are involved. And how the you know the equipment's being used in the sand, etc. So you you got a good visual. Yeah, image. I had uh, I had the maintenance department underneath me as well as the uh, the pilots down in Nigeria. Wonderful. So I was uh, it was a tough year, but uh, in terms of living conditions and food and stuff, yes. but it was it was great flying. There was no radar. You could just you know you pretty much were on your own, and uh, so uh, you can bear the fruits of that or. Uh, of the enjoyment of not being over controlled, but at the same time you're on your own. That's so, exciting. Yeah. That is so exciting. So from here we've got Nigeria and the operations, and it says quitting Aloha. Yeah, in uh, 
1982, 84, excuse me, 1984, two years after I came back from Nigeria, the company didn't look like they were expanding much. Mm. Yes, yes. So I was getting itchy feet, so I went to, uh, prior to quitting, there was an airline starting up in Hawaii called South Pacific Island Airways with 707s. That's a small plane, right? Uh, uh, 707 is a big airplane. Oh, it is. Okay, thank yeah, you. Yeah, it's actually bigger than the 737-727. Oh, I didn't know it's, that. Uh, it was kind of the, uh, well, it was the first Boeing jetliner that was so successful. It went to Pan Am, TWA, mm. uh, United. So it was uh, it was long range, coast to coast, over to Europe, uh, nonstop to Hawaii. So it was a pretty, pretty sizable big. airplane. Lots of fuel. Uh, yeah, it weighed about 330,000 pounds. So it was wow. a big one. About... Uh, three times the size of the original 737 in terms wow. of weight. Right, right. Based upon weight. So I thought that would be uh, interesting. So I decided I'd uh, made some pretty good money down in Nigeria with the bonuses. So I invested in getting a 707 license at, uh, well, let me reverse this. Yeah, well, a 707 license at, uh, at American where they had done their training and, uh, it didn't uh, quite work out. They came back eventually asking for me. By then, I'd already moved on. Right. And right. so uh, that was uh, another little footnote in the... Uh, in the journey. Uh, well, I find out most people, they kind of have to zigzag to the end result. That's right. No, and the zigzagging actually was uh, the reason that Boeing hired me. I had uh, got to back up again, if you don't mind. Take your time. Is that... Uh, we were so su successful with our uh, 737 operation uh, in Nigeria that uh, the company bid on the 747. And we got the 747 bid. And then, uh, so I went to training up in London on the 747 myself and five other guys. And uh, we were going to be, uh, hopefully, with the contract to fly the 747 for several more years. Well, the Corruption in Africa was huge, and oh. there was payoffs and everything else. So after we got trained and everything else, uh, the contract was awarded to somebody else. So uh, came back uh, uh, to Aloha. So, but in the interim, I picked up uh, basically. I of course had to have my 737 type rating, which is captain's license to fly right. for Aloha that way. Uh, while I was down in uh, Africa, uh, I picked up the 747 rating. And then the 707 rating for that uh, SPI outfit. So I had three Boeing jets uh, on my license. Wow. And I had uh, always wanted to go to work for the manufacturer. Really? And so I... Uh, Why is that? I've got to ask you. Well, I just thought it would be exciting to fly new airplanes and all the different types of airplanes. Yeah, and, all the time. And, uh, you know, there's several different... Uh, organizations that you can be in. You can be the in the instructing uh, and you can be in production tests, you can be in engineering tests. That's where the you know the uh, Tex Johnsons are and the right. you know the Chuck Yeager types are uh, yes. at that yes. end of the, the spectrum. So there's a lot of entry levels there. So um, I ended up getting a very nice letter back from Boeing and it was probably the nicest letter I've ever had saying that you're not qualified. <laughs> so, I was expecting never, the exact I'll, opposite. <laughs> I'll, I'll never forget that. It was the nicest turn down. Yeah, huh? And the, the, the gentleman's name is Al Jones. Unfortunately, right. he passed away a, a couple of years ago, but uh, I, I got to meet him later right. on. And right. uh, I told him that uh, same story that I just told you. So um, in 80, well, when I quit Aloha, jumping around here a little bit, sure. my apologies. That's fine. But when I quit Aloha, I uh, had the bug to uh, uh, start an airline. So I had some money in the bank and stuff, and so I decided I'd uh, give it a go. I ended With up, your own money? Well, just for the initial, just gathering the attorneys together and some other people. Right. Getting, yeah. And I was able to get... Uh, Feed the pump. Yeah. I was able to get the uh, investors in the Nigerian operation to, to take a look. And we were looking at a 
sale of an airplane to generate uh, some significant capital, at least a million bucks, to kind of be our uh, initial startup money. And, and that's low. Uh, that wasn't a loan. That was out of the sale of an aircraft. I, low is what I'm thinking. Low investment for the yeah, airline. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's just just starter. It's Tennis. a build up to it. Yeah. So uh, unfortunately, that sale fell through uh, due to the uh, demands of the broker. He wanted all of his fees up front, and we said no. We'll pay them to you amortized over the lease of the aircraft. And right. I don't need to go into all the details, but it fell apart, and uh, so. Uh, Eventually, I personally ran out of money in trying that venture, so I uh, aborted that, and I was picked up by uh, Air California after they'd been just bought out by American Airlines. Mm -hmm. So while I was in ground school at uh, American Airlines slash Air Cal on the 737, um, I got an offer uh, from Boeing at uh, well, several times the salary. But there was a big spat between AirCal and American on seniority lists. And seniority is your lifeblood in the airline business. Oh, okay. Everything goes by seniority. Your, your seat with your co-pilot captain, type of equipment you're on to your days off. Uh, so it's, it, seniority is extremely important in the airline business. So anyway, American had offered AirCal that they were going to hire six guys for every one of us on the seniority list, even though they weren't even hired yet. There'd be phantom people ahead of you. And that pushed me way down the list, so the American Airlines deal wasn't all that attractive. It would have been over the long run. Uh, my contemporaries there did end up um, doing quite well, but uh, like I said, I had an interest in going to work for the manufacturer, and uh, it, uh, I wasn't married then, but my wife, G, who I did marry, she was very encouraging for me to just keep bothering Boeing. So I'd, I'd bother them, you know, once a month. And uh, eventually uh, um, they called me back, and uh, so they offered me an interview and, a, and uh, a, an evaluation in the simulator and to see if I'd be qualified. And so uh, afterwards I had to chuckle. I said, they said, well, Rick, you know the reason why we hired you? I says, I, 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 no I don't know. I didn't, <laughs> didn't overly impress myself on my, <clears throat> on my uh, sim evaluation and other things. He said, well, we decided if you'd spend a year down in Nigeria, we could send you anywhere. <laughs> so if I said, well, that all computes. <laughs> That's funny. So uh, anyway, and it, was, it was just a delight. I mean, going to bowling, everything was first class, and yeah. uh, it was uh, a lot of com camaraderie then. Uh, this was well before the Douglas merger. That's a, another piece of the Boeing history that uh, I lived uh, later on. Boeing was uh, 1987, and uh, it was, uh, the company was doing great then. Good season for it. And so uh, I was on the 737, this is kind of your progression, 737. 727 was no longer manufactured, so uh, that was kind of out of the uh, stepping on the ladder. So then I went to the 757 and 767, all within a year. Um, Boeing wanted you to be qualified on at least two airplanes to where you could instruct and deliver airplanes and fly with the customer. Whatever and, needs uh, be done, huh? Yeah, and so it was fun. Many times you take your customer from the simulator mm -hmm. to the airplane training, and then you'd uh, deliver the airplane with them, perhaps over the Atlantic, go to Europe, and fly with them for a month in Europe. I bet you're very good at that because you've, you've got a very good people skill level. I've always noticed that. And I thought, he can probably relate to a lot of people. So I bet you they loved having you. Well, I, I think so. And well received, and uh, many of them became uh, lifelong friends. Wonderful. So uh, it was... Uh, a great time, and then I got promoted to being a uh, not only an instructor pilot, but a check airman. A check, what? A check airman is one that actually you have to have uh, proficiency checks every so often. And I was uh, promoted to the point of where I was able to give those proficiency checks um, on the airplanes that I was rated on. And so that's called a check airman. Interesting. So uh, I finished my first tour at Boeing. I, Actually, was hired by Boeing twice. 
Oh, really? Um, and uh, with the uh, uh, how that happened was, well, I better give a little bit of background on this. 747-400 was being uh, certified in 1989. I was hired in, in uh, 1987. Like I said, it was pretty fast progression. So it went 737, 75, 767, and then the Gulf War broke out. Oh, that's a big hassle. Yeah, and so the first Gulf War. So a lot of my contemporaries were at McCord, mm -hmm. and they got called up. They're gone. Yeah, that's exactly it. So they're gone, but Boeing had to fill those seats with the instructors and everything else. So I actually got a seat or an offer to fly the 747-400 earlier than I would have if the Gulf War wouldn't have taken place. So it was actually a, a boost in your career almost. Yeah, I was accelerated because of the uh, those that were senior to me and who, who would have gone on the airplane uh, before me were now their reserves were called up and they were full-time flying in the Gulf. Wow, so, uh, what an opportunity. Yeah, it was, it was great. So uh, ended up uh, working with several customers and then uh, I actually helped uh, Asiana in uh, the 767 airplane training and checking. And then I also helped them on the 747. And then they asked myself and, and well, several of us, only two of us took the offer, myself and my close friend Jack Arnold. Uh, we ended up uh, accepting the offer to go to Asian Airlines to uh, fly the 747 and to help train and check their their people over there. Mm -hmm. And uh, they tripled my salary from what I was making at Boeing. Boy, that's a good day. It is a good day. So uh, <laughs> Times <I'd>, three. <laughs> but Boeing had treated me so well, and I'd uh, right. only been there now five years. And like I said, I was promoted rapidly. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I did owe them at least a thank you. So I went to my boss, and uh, I told him what was going on. He said, good. well, thank you for coming in. He says, you know, of course, I can't meet that offer. Right. And I right. said, I, I know that. That's, but that's, I'm sure he was grateful that you yeah, came in. Yeah. So anyway, that was... Not the purpose of it to try to squeeze Boeing because it wasn't going to happen, but the uh, idea was just the uh, you know professional courtesy. Of, yes, and uh, yeah, and that's and so important. Great guys. In fact, a lot of those guys are friends of mine Today. to this day. So uh, anyway, is that? Uh, but he said, you know, if it doesn't work out, you always got your job back. Well, ah, li little, lovely. Little did I know that I would actually come back some ten years later, but. Uh, Anyway, off to Asiana, <coughs> became the uh, chief pilot for the uh, foreign pilots there. We had, uh, oh, I don't know, at least, uh, so we had the uh, South Africans, we had the British, of course we had the Americans, uh, and uh, we had the Malaysians coming up. So I had uh, four or five nationalities that I had to deal with and stuff. And, wow. But they were all pretty good guys. So on the 747 fleet, we had... Uh, um, some real solid pilots, so that made my job easier. So, so correct me if I'm wrong, but what I've seen when I've been flying is that pilots generally are very high quality people, and they all have to know English, so you have some level of right. Yeah, yeah, we could communicate. Um, the uh, the foreign pilots spoke very strong English, but we were integrated with the Korean crews too, and Asiana being a Korean airline is uh, uh, sometimes we did have some language barriers there. Mm -hmm. So although they were, in theory, like you were saying, international pilots, uh, the strengths of uh, their uh, English skills was, was variable. Interesting. That's fantastic. So, uh, it, some, some, of the, some of the communications were humorous. Some of them were, were a little bit more exciting. But... Uh, <laughs> I like that. A little bit more exciting. So, uh, anyway. But, <laughs> pull up, pull up, pull up. No, I'm yeah, just joking. Yeah, it was really that dramatic, <laughs> but uh, uh, many times it was, uh, you know, we were there to teach them how to fly. Right, and, and right. Part of that is communicating. So, yes. Uh, and a lot of the uh, pilots came from the Korean Air Force, and they had not flown really off outside of Korea unless 
the few of those that sometimes uh, uh, worked with the United States Air Force and stuff, uh, those guys had a little bit more experience outside the Korean Peninsula and typically spoke better English, but uh, it was more the controllers that would get frustrated uh, in terms of communicating back and forth. Right, so, right. Uh, uh, sometimes you'd have to intervene to because the controller would be getting a little excited, you know, when they read back the clearance and the read back was not what the controller had said. Mm. So you didn't want to step on them right away. Step is a kind of a, a term that we use in aviation, you know, where you step on one's communications. So you try to let them work it out, but then there was a point at which the controller was getting pretty uh, yes. intense, and then you'd intervene and come yes. back. And then, uh, you know, they'd know right away that then... They didn't get that excited because they knew that there was a strong English speaker on board. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, one later on, I had the opportunity to meet a couple controllers, and I said, hey, guys, you do a great job. You know, I said, i got to apologize because, you know, it's uh, we were brought on to, to help teach these guys how to fly and communicate. So I can't just, you know, jump on them right away if they get the first thing wrong. So, you know... Uh, there might be a couple of readbacks that are incorrect, and I know you guys are moving a lot of traffic and everything else. And they said, yeah, we kind of figured that out. We got to the point of where if the airplane went to where we wanted to go, we didn't get so uptight, regardless <laughs> of the communication. So, it's in the right direction. Yeah, so, so we know that the word was getting through. It's but, getting through. Yeah. Now, if I'm correct, uh, the accident rate is so unbelievably low in the airline industry, it's almost insignificant. Is that true? Well, it's it's improved tremendously. I mean, there's no question about it. Um, we've had, uh, you know, from learning about wind shear to uh, control flight into terrain with our new warning systems. Right. Uh, uh, TCAS, which alerts you to other airplanes. I mean, uh, there's been uh, significant uh, technological uh, jumps, but... Um, after I left Asiana, the, we had this horrible accident in San Francisco. Really? Tell me about that. Uh, it, was, uh, it was some of the similar problems that we had noticed uh, before mm -hmm. and uh, on the 747. Um, the pilot going in San Francisco, he had flown into San Francisco on the 747, was now getting checked out on the 777, which is a newer, later airplane, as you know. And uh, anyway, is that he was under uh, supervision of an instructor pilot mm -hmm. or check pilot. I don't know which, but anyway. Uh, and uh, so they were going into San Francisco. Beautiful day. But the ILS, the instrument landing system, which gives you the glide path mm -hmm. to the runway, was out of service. Oh. So, But they still had a visual. I mean, what you right. have is you have your electronic from the inside. Right. But you... So you could couple it, hook up the autopilot to fly that beam down to the runway. Okay. But with the ILS out and the VASI there, which gives you basically red and white lights to tell you whether you're on, on path or not, you can't lock your autopilot onto that. So you'd have to hand fly it. So he um, was uh, apparently quite nervous about the fact that he had to hand fly it. And uh, they end up uh, hitting the uh, the bulkhead on the runway, you know, San Francisco Airport. On the goes, incoming. Yeah, goes into the right. water. So the breakwater there, the right. bulkhead or breakwater, right. they plowed into that and the oh, airplane no. was destroyed. Oh, no. Yeah, it was. So a, just turned it nose down? Yeah, beautiful day, nothing wrong with the airplane. Right. Um, you know, it just uh, appalled the industry that uh, an accident oh, could happen uh, like that. On How just, horrifying. Uh, How horrifying. Yeah. So it was. Uh, uh, it was really an um, eye-opener, and like right. I said, the safety record around the world has been great. Mm -hmm. uh, there was uh, a time that uh, um, the U.S. considered uh, uh, not allowing the Korean airlines, Korea and Korean airlines and Asian airlines, to fly into the U.S. because of some of these accidents. But uh, you know, Korea is an important ally, so there was a lot of State Department stuff and everything else. So. Um, they ended up getting some help from major airlines. Good, and, good, good, uh, good. They, uh, they certainly improved the environment. So uh, 
safety record of the Korean airlines compared to uh, uh, the U.S. or to Australia, which has one of the, probably the safest in the world, and the European airlines was really quite substandard. So uh, anyway, it uh, it was an interesting, challenging time, and uh, uh, some wild stories that I only like to tell when I'm with other people that had flown down there because yes. they sound so incredible. Yes, yes. But not, not in terms of, uh, you know, really uh, dangerous stuff. Uh, some of it was, but not a lot. The other part is just more humorous, too. So anyway, I'll leave it at that. So I stayed uh, there for five years. And uh, back around again, going back to Africa now, Back in Africa. <laughs> One of the investors came back and says, hey, I'm thinking about starting my own airline. And you always, you know, he knew that I had made an attempt at it. Now, if I'm right, I was washing your windows at this time about. Yeah, you would be. Okay, I, because your wife was mentioning some things. Okay. Yeah, so uh, anyway, and that that's more than 20 years now. Really? So anyway, is that uh, um, Kevin Stamper is his name. And uh, he asked me if I'd be interested in helping getting an airline started. And I said, of course, Kevin, I've always kind of dreamed of that. And he says, I know, that's why I'm asking. And so uh, this time there was some real money involved. Uh, his father was the president of the Boeing Company for over 10 years. Really? And he came from the automobile industry out of Detroit. So we were able to get some investors uh, out of Detroit. Uh, Very plus. high High quality people. Man. Yeah, Chrysler, General Motors, and all that. And uh, so they invested, uh, as well as the UAW, United Auto Workers. And uh, so we had some real money. So along the certification process is that um, we had to make a huge change. You'll note on my notes that I gave you, as I said, two crashes that were significant in Pro Air. This was the name of the company that we flew. The original idea of Pro Air was to fly uh, NBA basketball teams. And uh, that didn't quite work out, but we just, the name stuck, so we stuck with ProWare. It's a good name. So anyway, we'll uh, back up to the certification process. So about, about halfway through the certification process, ValueJet, I don't know if that rings a bell to you. No. Probably it's more of a, you know, if you're in aviation, you'd probably recall this one. You know, we had a crash in the Evergreens, but uh, the um, it was very nasty. Lost everybody on board. Oh no! But uh, the FAA got a lot of criticism for certifying all these startup carriers with old beat up equipment. We were kind of going down the same path with older seven thirty sevens, and uh, uh, we felt that the appetite for the FAA was just not there. Okay. So between Malcolm Stamper being the past president of Boeing, he ended up working a deal to where we ended up with two brand new 737s. Really? Uh, the last of the line on the 737-400. And this was certainly a paradigm shift in the, uh, the way that the FAA looked at us and certification. The other impact of that crash was the bar for entry for our airline certificate it went way, way up. Oh, okay. And I have to compliment the Seattle FISDO Flight Standards Dis District Office by the principals, the inspectors that they gave us were very, very competent and very helpful to help us navigate through it. So uh, we ended up getting our certificate in about a year and a half. And uh, so uh, it was, uh, you know, all the learning curve of a small airline. You know, you didn't have the, you know, one airplane gets pulled out for some reason. I mean, Didn't eventually we only had four airplanes. Yeah. So that's 25% of the fleet is down. Um, we uh, unfortunately had some ground equipment run into uh, one of our airplanes, so that was grounded for several days while we prepared that. We had an airplane pushed back out of, uh, I, think it was, I think it was LaGuardia. Yeah, I'm sure it was LaGuardia to where they pushed our airplane back into another airplane, not the cruise fault or anything else. It was our, the ground handling, so that damaged our, our airplanes. Okay. You know, all the suffering of going through that. And, of course, um, we had, uh, you know, a fair amount of attrition. Uh, 
Mm-hmm. You know, airlines were flying. So basically by hiring the guys, getting them qualified at Pro Air, checked out on the 737, is that they actually, you know, up their uh, their resume and their qualifications. So mm-hmm. they, rightfully so, went off to other airlines and sure, stuff. Sure. So there's, there's a constant uh, uh, flow of, of new pilots coming in. And very expensive, you know, when that mm-hmm. happens. So we had crewing issues and everything else. But it was, it was a... A challenge, and we were uh, starting to do fairly well, fairly well, not fairly well, fairly well, <laughs> in, um, uh, oh, just uh, in about uh, 99 to 2000, we're starting to, we caught investors' eyes uh, because we were backed by GM and Chrysler right, and the UAW, names. so... Uh, uh, they were looking at uh, possibly taking us public, mm. and uh, so anyway, as then along comes the, you might remember this one, the Alaska Airlines crash off of California. Something in the back of my mind, but I don't know any details. Yeah, that Go was ahead. in the late 90s, and so, like I mentioned, these were the two crashes that had a big impact. I was talking about the value jet and how that we made a paradigm shift to new airplanes. And right. That was probably a positive thing uh, that the uh, you know the entry level was increased quite a bit that actually was to our benefit mm-hmm. even though it caused a lot of pain at the time mm-hmm. so certificates of pro air were in Seattle got you as well as Alaska Airlines okay well we were having some financial problems you know we're still working at it we're still trying to get our mm-hmm. next level of financing etc cetera, etc cetera. And uh, so, uh, basically, looking back on it, the local uh, certificate management office panicked, and we virtually had the FAA just jump all over us. We Mm. had an FAA inspector on every flight. We had him ripping apart our maintenance department, et cetera, et cetera, because they were afraid after what happened on Alaska, which is very well run airline uh, profitable <clears throat> and then here they had this uh, uh, black sheep of this new airline that was having financial troubles uh, issues up right. probably is a better way to put it um, but uh, we weren't cutting maintenance we weren't uh, uh, we had a lot of our maintenance done by United Airlines and uh, so and the pilots certainly were doing fine by the route inspections and everything else right Short of it, uh, they ended up pulling our certificate. Oh no! Grounding us, in fact. Right. And uh, you probably didn't have the financial to take you through. Well, that there's there's two different pieces to that. The Department of Transportation, of which the um, FAA is a subsidiary of, I guess, or is, sure. is in the same organization. The DOT, at a different level, determines the financial fitness. Okay. Now, there's, certainly they take reports from the FAA, but <clears throat> they shut us down for, quote, safety reasons. Um, we ended up uh, going to the NTSB, appealing them, and we won, we won both of them. Good. Congratulations. Too late. We're was, broke. Yeah, Nobody's going to touch us now. Yeah. So when you get, uh, you know, when your certificate is uh, revoked by emergency, I mean, you are a pariah in the industry. Right. So we... Uh, Declared bankruptcy to save whatever assets we had. Wow. And uh, so, uh, you know, it certainly um, affected me financially quite a bit because I had uh, taken a huge pay cut and stuff to get this thing going. Sure, um, sure. You know, I Because you wanted it. <clears throat> yeah, and I had stock now that was worthless. Right. And so... Uh, Very difficult. Back comes Boeing to the rescue. In the year 2000 was when they pulled our certificate at the end of 2000. And so in early 2001, my friends and contemporaries now became the managers in the flight crew training department. So if you remember earlier, I said that I went over seas with my buddy Jack Arnold, and Jack actually went on to uh, run the, tra- the training department at Pro Air as well. So with that, uh, the uh, chief pilot and this assistant chief pilot came to Jack and I and said, uh, would you like to come back to work at Boeing? And I said, 
Oh, would we? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I just, where do I sign? Yeah, that's exactly. <laughs> you know, my airline just went broke. I'm, <laughs> I'm looking at house payments and everything else. <laughs> that's it. And uh, I figured, uh, you know, being a, a senior officer in a company that had their certificate revoked, I mean, I'd be lucky if I could get anything. Yeah, you know. And uh, so my contemporaries that were now the bosses I said, look, we had a lot of money invested in both you guys before you left. And uh, we like the work that you were doing, and now you bring some different experience back to us, but we could certainly use you. And uh, they gave both Jack and I an offer that basically was the same as if we never left. Wow. Yeah, that was it. I've always seen Boeing in a wonderful company. Yeah, so uh, that was... Uh, <sighs> That's it, incredible. In fact, a funny anecdote about that is that uh, they said, uh, Rick, we'd like to take you out to lunch and you know discuss... Uh, discuss an offer. And so uh, anyway, as if they sat down, they gave me the offer. I said, you've got to be kidding. You know, like, You're shocked. Yeah, but you know, when you say it that way, you've got to be kidding. It's like it's too low. And I instantly realized, looking at their faces, I said, no, 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 guys. This is more than I ever expected. Never dreamed of. That's yeah, and I said, and by the way, I've got lunch. But uh, so anyway, and then uh, went back to the uh, Boeing, which I'll call my second tour of Boeing. Yeah. And uh, so I was working my way up again. Um, well, actually, no, I did stay on the 747 because we brought a lot of experience on the 747, both Jack and I. But we had to check out on a newer model of the 737 called the Next Generation. So we went back into ground school on the 737. Jack and I were trained together on that. And uh, then, of course, we... Uh, uh, with our experience on the uh, 7-4, we, you know, did a lot of training on the 7-4. So anyway, um, back in the saddle as an instructor pilot uh, and working our way back up again. And then uh, you'll notice in there I said something about uh, negotiating the pilot's uh, contract. Correct. I, I just wanted to go in. I wanted to be. Low key, I'm so happy to have a <laughs> good paying job. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I'm working. Talk, talk I'm about, working. Talk about a parachute, you know. Yeah. And so they asked me if I would help negotiate the pilot's contract. I said, "Oh, come on, guys! I just, you know, like I said, I just want to be really low key." And yeah, I just, I just yeah. want a quiet yeah. employee. Yeah. So uh, anyway, is it uh, against my better judgment? I ended up uh, um, joining the negotiating team and. It all worked out fine. It but, did. Uh, but uh, anyway, so after we got that done, uh, Boeing had a reduction going on. The guys, I just like to mention their names, Jim Wallace and Bob Sweeney were trying to keep as many pilots on board as they could. So out of the training out. organization, uh, there was a shortfall in the corporate flying, you know, mm -hmm. flying executives around. So a couple of the training pilots went over there and flew uh, on the corpus side. And then there was a retirement of the uh, 747 chief technical pilot. The offer came up, uh, and lo and behold, uh, we were asked Jack and myself whether we would be interested in it. So we said certainly, so we went over and interviewed for that. And uh, it was, uh, we, our careers had been matched so closely almost Ten years before, there, there wasn't a huge difference in our qualifications, although he was ex-military. And uh, so uh, we get in front of uh, John Creighton, who's the boss, and he says, who wants a 757, who wants a 747? Well, we both raised our hands on the 747. So we flipped a coin, and I won the toss. <laughs> so I became the 747 chief te technical pilot. How wonderful. And uh, so that... Uh, it's a jack of all trades. It was a lot of fun. We ended up uh, um, working on the project. In fact, you see the large cargo freighter up there, that model? Yeah. The big uh, wide airplane there. That was designed to carry the 787 parts from Japan oh, and yes. from Europe. Just if you remember that. Yes, I, remember. So they, I think I saw it up at Everett. Yeah, you would have. And uh, they flew the big sections into Everett for assembly and stuff. And so. Do they still fly that? Yeah. Yep. They do. Yeah, and so because that uh, looks like a big whale. Yeah, it is, and so uh, and the tail swings open, and uh, so you can 
load, load the long fuselage sections in yeah. it. So I was involved uh, in that airplane, got to flight test it uh, with some of the engineering test pilots and stuff. And then also uh, after we got the airplane certified, they said, you've run an airline before. And we were waiting for the uh, Evergreen Airlines to get the 747-400, which this is a derivative of, on their certificate so they could fly it. They were the ones that were contracted. So for about six months, uh, Boeing ended up flying the big sections from Japan, Italy, to uh, South Carolina, Charleston, as well as Everett. And so I was uh, uh, basically asked to run that operation. So, uh, and that went, uh, went well, and we flew with the Evergreen Green Pilots to give them some uh, training in the 747-400. They'd come off the classic 747, which we call the uh, 100, 200, 300. Okay. And uh, those were the ones with the flight engineer. So they had to adjust from a three-man cockpit to a two-man cockpit. And all the, you know, the upgraded avionics and stuff to what we call a glass cockpit. So it was good to fly with them. And then uh, it was, uh, we were successful on that. And uh, so that was one of the jobs. Uh, the other job was probably my day job. 747-400 large cargo freighter. Uh, we got that certified and then, like I said, we ended up flying the parts while the airline got their certification to fly the airplane or the big sections of the 787. <coughs> uh, but my typical day job as being the chief technical pilot was more involved in manuals like writing the uh, 747 flight crew training manual being the uh, author and editor of that. Wow, that's a lot of I guess author, author would be uh, a better uh, term. And uh, somewhere along the road there, I ended up getting promoted to the uh, <coughs> assistant chief technical pilot to where I had the 747, 757, 767, and for a short time, the 737 underneath me. So I was responsible for the... Uh, Flight crew training manuals, uh, also operational bulletins that come out. Uh, basically, there, if a procedure is modified and it hasn't been incorporated yet in the the manuals, you'd put out the bulletin until it's incorporated in the manuals. So, uh, also answering customer questions on the various airplanes. So I had a pretty good team below me, but my specific airplane was a 74 at that time, with uh, supervising the other groups. So. Uh, and along comes the uh, 747-8. And uh, we had, uh, I'd worked closely with uh, Joe McDonald on the large cargo freighter, and uh, we ended up establishing quite a friendship uh, with our working together on that. And uh, Joe was uh, a year older than me, and so he invited me into the early development of the 747-8, again bringing my 747 background along and a airline pilot's perspective. So uh, ended up uh, working on that. So I took it from a paper airplane to certification and uh, Joe retired in between there. Uh, basically the 747-400 was delayed, uh, excuse me, the Dash 8 was delayed about a year and a half. The 787 was delayed almost at least two and a half years, if not three. Mm -hmm. And so he decided he was going to retire. So you had your option to go out at 60 and get your two years extra pay that I mentioned earlier. I don't know if that's on tape or not. No, you can go ahead. I'll and go back it. and explain that. At Boeing, we had to retire by 63. And if you had 10 years or more experience as a captain at Boeing. You could retire at 60 and they would pay you two years additional oh, pay. Wonderful. Or up to 63 and two years of additional pay, which would take you to 65. Wonderful. The airlines would allow you to fly to 65. So Joe opted out on his 60th birthday, got his two years there. So uh, Joe was replaced by uh, another great uh, chief pilot on the 747 by Mark Firestein. So Mark continued uh, with uh, Joe's philosophy of 
of keeping the technical pilots very much involved in the in the 747-8 program. Mm -hmm. So uh, I ended up uh, working closely with Mark and the customers. Our our launch customers were uh, Cargo Lux, All Nippon Cargo, or excuse me, Nippon Cargo, and Cathay Pacific. And they were just great customers. So we dealt with them quite a bit, trying to. Uh, incorporate their recommendations as much as we could and so it turned out to be hard work but uh, a lot of fun and then I was assigned to have the first flight on the second 747-8 that came out of the factory. Really? So the chief Brand pilot new. Took, chief pilot took the first one, Mark Firestein, and then uh, myself and Kirk Vining took out the uh, the second one, I was actually a co-pilot on that. You didn't scratch the paint, did you? No, we didn't scratch the paint. <laughs> so uh, I had a very successful flight and then uh, worked that uh, through. Now the airplane has just come out. It's not been certified yet. Right. You know, so there's a lot of uh, testing that needs to go go on that. So I was invited to do uh, well, about 250 hours worth of testing on it, uh, some of which I was a captain on the airplane. Um, ended up doing what we call uh, certification testing with the FAA actually in the airplane. Although the Boeing guys can do some of the... Basically, when you go out to get something certified on the airplane, you notify the FAA. And they have the choice of either coming along with one of their pilots or delegating it to you. Okay. So I had some flights uh, with the FAA. And uh, so building up through all the various tests to... Uh, where I ended up with about 250 hours of uh, pilot command time out of the certification process. And probably my, my biggest role, and I should have mentioned this on the large cargo freighter, was that Boeing wanted both those airplanes to be the same type rating. And by the same type rating, it meant that the pilots would only have to go through a low-grade ground school to get qualified. There'd be no simulator checks, no simulator time required. So I was successful with my team on the large cargo freighter, which was a much easier uh, thing to do because it was really, the other than the fuselage and the pressurization, it was really a 747-400. Well, 747-8 was a newer uh, airplane, different engines, all kinds of um, upgrades and everything else. But we were able to uh, get the 747-8 uh, as the same type rating. And the, one of the major events that uh, um, is called for is, first of all, you have to go through, make sure that any emergency checklists are all the same. Consistent. All the memory items have to be the same. And so we accomplished that. <clears throat> and then the, you go out with a couple of FAA guys who have never flown they flown the 400, but never flown the 8, the Dash 8. And we basically take them up in the airplane and we give them a check ride. And if they feel like the airplane handled close enough to what they were familiar with in the 400, then this is called a T2 test. They said, well, you passed your T2 test, so that uh, eliminated the simulator training. So that was accomplished both on the large, large cargo freighter and on the 747-8. So that was my two primary responsibilities on those airplanes. Um, but uh, as, a, uh, as a gift, they allowed me to go out and do some of the engineering flight testing with, with the pilots and stuff. So that was fun. Wonderful. So um, we got the airplane certified in 2011. And uh, so I was asked to... Uh, fly the airplane to Paris for the air show. Yeah, I see that. I bet 20, you that was exciting. Yeah, 2011, yeah. And uh, did you have a chance to go on the video that I... No, I didn't. No, yeah, I didn't. there's a video on it. But I'll check know, it out. That sounds it. wonderful. So anyway, <clears throat> um, the flight was uh, kind of unique in that it was the first flight across the Atlantic Ocean using biofuel in all four engines. And was, it, first time? First time, yeah. Really? They had some of the airplanes that used uh, biofuel. It, it was a blend, not 100%. It was okay. like 10% blend uh, in like one engine. But this was the first time they'd done it in all the engines. So that was one of the things that uh, we left Payne Field, Everett, and then flew it to uh, uh, Le Bourget. 
That's about France. seven, eight hours? Yeah. 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 And uh, had an uneventful trip. and uh, Stayed spent, up in the air? Yeah, spent two days in Paris, and then we flew the airplane down to Luxembourg because they were one of our launch customers to where yeah. the, uh, the airline could see their new airplane. And uh, so it was a wonderful trip. So uh, that was in um, June, July of 2011. And I took my last flight in uh, October, in October 2011 on a 747-8. That's so, exciting. So that was a wrap on my bowling career. So out of curiosity, um, everyone's always interested. Uh, I don't mean to be materialistic, but, but you also built a home in Jackson Hole. Right, yeah. I went there once. That is amazingly beautiful. Oh, it's gorgeous, yeah. Now, I'd never been there before. <clears throat> I had my e-bike there. It's just amazing. So, um, I mean, you've been all over the world. You live here in Seattle. You have a place in Jackson Hole. Is that like two of the most beautiful places in the world? I think so. I mean, I'm very lucky on that. Just give me the mountains and the ocean, and I'm, ha I'm yeah. happy. Yeah. Uh, I mentioned earlier on about my ski bum roots. Yes, And yes, so I yes. continue to ski throughout my... Uh, uh, my flying career, and in fact, early on at Aloha, when we were laid off uh, in the winters, um, I'd get, you know, full season in skiing. I actually <laughs> ended up being a ski patroller, a professional ski patroller up at... Uh, pro Patrol. At, yeah, Pro Patrol at Heavenly Valley, and that was a lot of fun. <laughs> That's wonderful. So, uh, anyways, it, uh, I'd gone through Jackson Hole many, many years ago, and I said, boy, I'd always like to maybe have a place here. Yeah. Yeah. So after it's my epic. It's after epic. my uh, African uh, experience, I had a uh, a little bit of money in the bank, and I not only was trying to start an airline, but I decided to I bought a lot up there and and build a log home up there at the same time. So, How wonderful! So uh, how wonderful! And uh, anyway, so it. Uh, it's been a great it was, life. Yeah, it was great. Yeah. Oh, wow. So uh, I just want to wrap up with this question. A lot of people are going through a lot of challenges right now. And uh, a lot of people want a better life. And I've, I've seen, I guess, through discipline, you've got this wonderful life. And you've lived long enough that, you know, we've gone through different wars and stuff. What type of advice would you have for people on how to think about living now and today? Well, probably one of the areas that I think our, <clears throat> our education fails us is that um, they really do not educate you all on finances. Mm, okay, that's true. Um, you know, you come out of high school without, you know, hardly any knowledge of finance. What interest rates and things will do for you and stuff. I fortunately had some people, including my dad, that were familiar with, you know, uh, how to deal in real estate. Oh, good. And that was very helpful. And some friends in real estate that uh, were helpful to do things. So um, I think getting uh, financially smart is one area that you need to, to look at. Um, because the building block for myself is really a house or an apartment and then I move my way up uh, over time so uh, um, you know certainly you don't get you don't want to get locked into paying for rent all your life correct uh, career wise um, there comes a time I think when you have to um, identify what you want to do I mean it's great having a, a lot of interests and everything else spread out wide and everything else but at some point you're gonna have to Focus and see if that, down. that will make a make a career for you. Give it a good good effort. You you may fail at it. Mm -hmm. That's but, true. But uh, but you can't be uh, scattered all the way across the spectrum. And uh, you're going to have to be a specialist of some type. Uh, generalists usually, um, uh, I guess that's a too broad broad of a statement. But uh, you're going to have to focus on some type of career and uh, look get at, your money right. Get your career right. Yeah, and you know they they both really come uh, come together because if you get your career right, you get the money to go, you know, purchase a home or do those things. Correct. You know, they're kind of they're kind of interlinked, and it's nice to be able to to build wealth through real estate and then live it in a nice place. And you know, you don't 
you don't get the uh, the ultimate prize on your first purchase. But uh, so I'd say that if you can get yourself educated financially, uh, pick something that you like. I mean, I couldn't imagine doing something for 40 years plus that I didn't like. And it sounds like you really, really, really enjoyed your career. I did, and uh, the you know it wasn't just the flying; it was the people. We had we had some characters. We had some extremely bright people. I mean, um, I was fortunate to really uh, work with some true geniuses and uh, hardworking guys and uh, and gals. And uh, it was uh, it was a more male oriented time that I mm -hmm. started my career in mm -hmm. and and stuff, but. Uh, it was good. It was a lot of honesty, a lot of uh, integrity. Like I said, my two friends brought me back, uh, Jack and myself, back uh, after our bankruptcy at Pro Air. Mm -hmm. um, there was just uh, a lot of uh, a lot of things to admire about the community as a whole in aviation. So the whole whole community was very supportive of each other. Yes, it is. Yeah, and even competitors uh, are. Uh, Supportive uh, when it comes down to maintenance or fixing a problem, uh, you know, uh, it's now they're cutthroat when they compete for passengers. Sure, but uh, when it comes down to the technical engineering, flying safety, right, all of those things are integrated. In fact, there's a lot of uh, uh, committees that are joined. Uh, you know, uh, Alpa, the Airline Pilots Association, the the unions, the big unions like. Uh, Alpa, like I just mentioned, and uh, American Airlines, uh, their Pilots Association, Southwest, along with the airlines. So the unions and the airlines really meet, uh, not adversarially, uh, under safety, as well as um, as well as the manufacturers. You know, Boeing, Douglas, and everybody else. So they have a you know, there's a lot of activity on the side to where they uh, join join in a common cause. That's awesome. And, uh, and out of that, there's been some tremendous friendships. That's awesome. That's really awesome. Well, thank you, Rick. Rick Braun from the Pacific Northwest here in his beautiful home. So thank you for your time. Well, thank you, Bill. It was interesting. I uh, enjoyed it. And uh, so uh, maybe let's take a look at a little clip here, see how it turned out.